behind the wheel, silence your phone. Or better yet, designate a texter. For more text-free driving tips, visit stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. People are always looking to invest in a good opportunity. So what if you could invest in the future of kids, like a stock? Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change called Better Futures. With your investment, it helps students like me go to college. My name is Charles, and I'm your dividend. Invest in better futures with UNCF. Visit uncf.org slash invest. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. Brought to you by UNCF and the Ad Council. Primary election. Lack of diversity. Gas prices. Michael Jackson. Trending topics. All right, welcome back. We are talking about... Um, trending topics and so the um so republicans just passed the tax cut and reform bill and i have a um a good list of what that might mean for the rest of us there are certain aspects of it um that have been debatable and some that have been you know received really well um and and so there's a lot of um great information and detail that I definitely want to share with you all, especially as we get into what it means to own your own business and be an entrepreneur, because there are implications um, in the tax bill, um, some of which are quite beneficial for business owners, for parents, um, the, um, what is it, the child tax, the uh, um, child tax credit. Cre- yeah, mm-hmm. the child tax credit has now doubled. It was 1000 now it's 2000 But I want to make sure I have that in front of me um, before I <laughs> give inaccurate information. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit um, later uh, about what this tax reform bill can mean for you guys um, for all of us Um, it's highly it's been highly controversial and one of the things that I want us to be able to do is kind of just look at what it is and and determine for ourselves whether or not this can work for our individual lives it's going to depend on our income brackets and our life situations we talked last week about Omarosa, um, Omarosa Manigault Newman, former contestant on his reality on Donald Trump's reality show The Apprentice. Um, so she has resigned, but she's also been from the reports have said that she's been asked to leave or that she was forcibly removed from the White House. She adamantly. Um, stands against, you know, stands that 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 did not happen. She did not get forcibly removed from the White House. Um, She has since made several TV appearances and um, of which I don't think necessarily plant her in the best light, point her in the best light. And so, um, and you feel free to... (laughs) to to sound off on any of this. Um, But I think one of my biggest concerns comes from the standpoint of a life coach. So from the standpoint of a life coach, you know, I saw her on Bethany, um, a talk show that, um, just really kind of a daytime talk show. And it, and she, to me, seemed like a person in some serious, severe denial about where she is. And she, you know, she was basically, um, chastising Bethany and saying things to the extent that, well, you know, you have a talk show. I don't even know if you're going to be here a year. I was in the white house. And my thought is, well, you just got dismissed from the White House. So, <laughs> so I just, you know, it's, it's a very interesting. We're going to continue to watch. A lot of people are speculating that she may have a book um, that's coming soon. And I don't know. Would Tandem Light Press pick her up? Mm, maybe. Maybe. It's all about the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, since we, we focus on empowering stories inspiring, and inspiring yes, stories, yes. Um, if hers was along those lines, then maybe. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, even bad press is still press. Yeah. So she is actually, you know, from a marketing perspective, she's going on these talk shows and she may be saying things that are sensational, but she's putting herself out there. Right. And she may be giving herself options now that she's left the White House or has been removed either one. Right. Um, she is, you know, maybe doing her own thing and trying to figure out where she's going from here. I right. don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and honestly, that's how she got herself out there in the first place. Yeah. That's how she became known was being inflammatory and having, mm-hmm. you know, very strong personality. So she's really kind of being consistent with who she's presented in the past. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if she got a talk show offer or if she got, you know, because she's getting so much attention and we're giving her even more attention Mm -hmm. right now. (laughs) So so I don't know. I'd be curious to know what you all have to um, say about that. If you were a publishing company, would you publish her? If you were a TV network, would you bring her on to be, um, to have her own show? Would you offer her a contract? Um, This is, 
you know, she says she has a brand and this is her brand. So it'd be interesting, interesting. to see where she goes with this, what yeah. happens or if it just kind of fizzles out and doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that, um, so what I thought was interesting about her appearance on, on Bethany is I thought, okay, well she's, she's on a show where the majority of audience is a white audience and she's already turned, turned off the black audience. So I don't know. I honestly don't know how the white audience is taking her, but if there was any inkling of hope for getting support, she completely just, you know, that was not, the, the audience was booing her. And it, so it just makes me wonder who, who are her allies going to be? Right. Who, who is she going to be able to reach out to? So it's a good question. <laughs> it's, it's a very good question. I yeah. mean, you know, I think we're, we're seeing though that it doesn't matter if people like you. This is true. Oh, God, that's so true. And that's, oh, I hate that. But you're which, so right. Which is terrible. I know. But, you know, I mean, we see it all the time yeah. in Hollywood and in politics. It yes. doesn't matter if people like you. There's usually, if you have the right support, even right. if it's only one person, you still have some kind of support. Right. Um, and especially if their pockets are deep, you know, then you can do pretty much anything. Yeah. Well, so what's interesting is last night um, I – the kids and I watched, I don't know if you guys are aware of this Netflix series called Black Mirror. Mm -hmm. And it is very interesting because it's all, a lot of it is technology based and it kind of shows us the worst of what could happen if we continue to be so addicted to technology. And this one particular episode, um, Nosedive, was all about how many likes you get and, and how important it is that every aspect of your life is dependent upon people's willingness to rate you at a five. Um, and what's scary about that is that I think that's the society that we're currently living in. So when you say that, you know, it doesn't even matter if people really like you, it's not. It's a matter of whether or not people will rate you at a five. Right. You know, did you portray the right image? Did you smile the right way? Did you, you know, pump up the masses the way that you should have? Okay, you get a five. I can't stand you, but you get a five. Right, exactly. <laughs> yep. That is scary. But, you know, the thing is, though, it all still wraps into the the way that business, the business world and, and publishing and being able to pro push and promote yourself. It's, it's about the presentation. And, you know, at some point, though, I have to believe that your personality has to matter. Well, it will, because what, what has to happen usually, or what we want to have happen, is that who you are and who you are perceived as in your book, let's mm -hmm. say, is the same person that will go and do speaking engagements in front of people. Right. And if those two things don't match up, then eventually it's going to catch up with the author or the business person in some form or fashion. Right. Um, and, and there will be some disconnect with the audience. And so then, you know, a lot of books are sold via word of mouth. And yes. so some people may say, well, I read the book, but I saw them speak and the book and the person didn't really match up. Okay. Um, and so I think that that's something that, that definitely happens. Um, and I've even met celebrities that, you know, their outside celebrity persona does not match up with who they are face to face. And wow. it kind of leaves like a bitter taste yeah. in your mouth. You go, hmm, maybe I won't watch their next movie right. or whatever. Yeah. So somehow that has to balance. And if it doesn't, then it could be devastating for a career or a book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would think at some point we hunger for real, the mm -hmm. real, what is the real? As, exactly. You know, at some point Authentic. we want to know what that is. Yeah. 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 All right. Stay with us. We'll be right back. People been saying to your friend, get a different face and posting on their feed. They're super Someone being bullied online, you can be a witness and make a difference by letting the world know it isn't cool and by letting your friend know you care. Learn more at eyewitnessbullying.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Listen, as a hiring manager, I've got to tell you, the best job candidate isn't always the typical candidate. Sometimes they're a grad of life. Meet the grads of life. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. Sometimes the best candidates aren't the ones you're used to. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. When I grow up, I want to be a new pair of blue jeans. When I grow up... 
I want to be a kid's first computer. I want to be a warm place on a cold I want to be a football stadium. I want to be a bike that races around the country. I want to be a bench on a forest trail. When I grow up, I don't want to be a piece of garbage. And if you recycle me, I won't be. Give your garbage another life. Recycle. Learn how at IWantToBeRecycled.org. Brought to you by Keep America Beautiful and the Ad Council. If you're looking for that ratchet, you're in the wrong place. It's the nation's urban internet station, Sensation Station Network. In the interest of science, 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 science. All right, so this morning science is actually about writing and psychology. And so we're looking at the, and this is an article that comes from um, Life Hacker. Um, and it was, let me see, it's a post that was um, written by Gregory Chiotti Psychological Benefits of Writing Regularly. So I know for myself, I, I, tend to find a little bit more balance in my life when I write on a regular basis. And so I love that um, this study kind of breaks down what, you know, what the benefits of that are. And so I'll just kind of give you the, the headlines. Um, first of all, writing can help you handle hard times. Letters to the broken hearted. Shameless plug. <laughs> we could do a whole show on that. Yes. <laughs> it helps you. It can help you handle hard times. In, in one study that followed recently fired engineers, the researchers found that those engineers who consistently engaged with expressive writing were able to find another job faster. So here's a quote. The engineers wrote, who wrote down their thoughts and feelings after losing their jobs reported feeling less anger and hostility toward their former employer. They also reported drinking less. Eight months later, less than 19% of the engineers in the control groups were reemployed full time compared with 52% of the engineers in the expressive writing group. Therapy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's like self therapy. Yeah. And, you know, we've done a lot of books um, that cover lots of different topics, but especially things like PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done several books um, prior to TLP for Vietnam veterans. And it was amazing to see the changes that they went through in the process of writing their story, wow. something that they'd been holding on to for 30 years and hadn't written down, and it helped them kind of come to terms with things. Right. And it was all of them, without fail, say that it was very cathartic, um, that they were able to process things. Even if they couldn't remember things, they would talk to other friends. Mm -hmm. But just being able to talk about it or right. have a platform to put it out there was so helpful for them. Even if they didn't do anything with it, mm -hmm. you know, just keeping it for themselves, it's helpful to say this experience actually happened. Right. These are my emotions as far as this experience co is concerned. And then you can kind of either put it in a drawer or publish it or give it to somebody else to read. Or burn um, it. Or I've burn it. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yes. it kind of validates you mm -hmm. and your feelings. Right. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And and so and to the and to the point of burning it, it was it was me writing down, wanting to to I guess it was a rites of passage to mm -hmm. move on to a new phase in my life, you know, after that particular phase. You yep. know? So it was really it actually felt kind of good. And I think if I remember correctly, um, you know, Facebook always has this a year ago mm -hmm. today kind of thing. And it was a year ago today. Oh, my that goodness. I threw that journal in the uh, and set it on fire and we we're done. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah, it was. That, it, it, yeah. So Facebook allows us to remember such things. But um, but that did come up as a memory for today, which is like, whoa, that's interesting. <laughs> so but I think it's also interesting. And I can if you all know me, you know, I can get caught up on the first point of a research study. So we might just be sharing this all throughout the show because <laughs> there's only one point but um the, what's funny about this is that the um the people in the study the engineers reported drinking less and it's funny because i write with a glass of wine <laughs> you know and i guess it'd be a little bit different than taking a bunch of shots you know yeah but. or or instead of feeling the emotion just channeling it through or numbing it numbing it yeah, yeah that's, exactly. that i think is the difference right you know absolutely. like deciding I'm going to be purposeful with this mm -hmm. or I'm just going to try to numb it right. in some way. Oh, that's so good. She sounds like my favorite researcher, <laughs> Brene Brown. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, um, so number two, and again, we're looking at the psychological benefits of writing. Um, and so number two is um, writing and gratitude. Absolutely love this one because I've learned that gratitude picks up your spirit no matter yeah. 
what you're going through. Um, if you are just purposeful, even if you don't mean it yet, you know, it's just like when you start going to the gym and you really are not a hardcore gym person, but all you do is get on the treadmill and you walk for 10 minutes. You're exercising a, um, a new, uh, what is it called? A new routine yeah. just by showing up, just by doing it. So I feel the same way about gratitude, just by being willing to say, you know what? I'm really grateful that my shoes or don't have holes in them, or <laughs> that's more of a negative, but you know what I mean? But just coming up with the things that you're grateful for really does lift your spirit. So um, as the authors of one study noted, subjects who reflected on the good things in their life once a week by writing them down were more positive and motivated about their current situations and their futures. I think as bad as people sometimes think they have it, number one, it can always be worse. It can always be worse. Um, and number two, I think just taking the time to say, these are, this is a list of things that I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. And once you start making that list and you realize how long it gets, yes. it can completely change your point of view right. on everything. And I think a lot of people tend to do that, especially around this time of year, around mm -hmm. Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. Um, and it's easier to reflect on the things that we're grateful for. But sometimes we get caught up in the holiday bustle and, oh, my God, I have to drive here and I have to go here and I have to cook this and I have to buy these yes. presents. So or just, this person's no longer here to celebrate right, with. Right, exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah. Um, then making a list or just even, in, you know, an internal list mm -hmm. of, of those points of gratitude can be so helpful for and it could be the start of a book. It can be a you start never of a, know. a book called Points of Gratitude. <laughs> That title whoever, is copyright. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like whoever comes with us to that, you know, comes with us with that one first, you know. Exactly. But, uh, exactly. But yeah, I, absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. And, um, and the other thing is, um, here's the catch. When they, so the, the, when they reflected once a week by writing them down, they were more positive and motivated. The, the catch was that when they wrote about what they're grateful for every day, the benefits were minimal. Really? Yes. That's surprising, really right? Well, the reason why is because any activity can feel disingenuous and just plain mm -hmm. boring if you do it so often. So you start taking it for granted. Yep. The irony yes, of taking exactly. your gratitude, of gratitude for, for granted. granted. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so the key is to reflect and write down, write about gratitude regularly, but not begrudgingly often. Right. So, because then it feels like a chore. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, even the greatest things like sex can feel like a chore if it's like, done too often. If it's done and yeah, it's and just, without enthusiasm. With, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you want to kind of give it a little spark in the same way that we want to give our sex lives sparks. How I went to sex, I don't know, but we'll be right back. <laughs> party fouls are pretty dumb, but if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Learn more at ultimatepartyfoul.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Great leaders aren't born. They're made. And not just anywhere. They're made in special places by special qualified trainers in places like the Academy of Creative Coaching. The Academy of Creative Coaching is an international certification program with courses in health and wellness coaching, spiritual coaching, relationship coaching, executive coaching, life coaching, and cultural competency coaching. Courses are online, hybrid, or face-to-face. -face. The Academy of Creative Coaching is empowering coaches to empower the world. Make a positive change in yourself and the world. Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com. You don't usually get a stock tip from a 16-year-old, but I'm here to tell you about a different kind of stock. It's called Better Futures, a stock for social change that's not about making money. Instead, you invest to help students like me go to college. This is beyond a simple donation. It's the opportunity for America to invest in its kids and take an active stake in the future of the country. The return on your investment isn't money. What you get back is knowing you protected our potential. So one day, that potential can grow up to become surgeons and architects, executives and engineers, people who can change the future just by being a part of it. My name is Alicia, and I am your dividend. Invest in better futures with UNCF. Visit uncf.org slash invest. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. A public service announcement brought to you by UNCF and the Ad Council.
Driving has a rhythm all its own. Don't wreck it with a text. Before you get behind the wheel, silence your phone. Or better yet, designate a texter. For more text-free driving tips, visit StopTextStopRex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Keeping your balance with Dr. Pamela. Dr. Pamela. Dr. Pamela. All right, so this week's balance challenge is about writing because we have time, right? Well, maybe not all of us, not all of us, because some of us are extra busy during the season, especially um, depending on what your career, what your job is. Um, This might be just crazy time for you. Um, For me, it's a bit calm. I just submitted grades on Wednesday, so I'm like, ah! free. But for those of you who are, actually, I challenge all of you to do this. Um, We are talking about the psychological benefits of writing regularly. And one of the benefits is that um, when you write for gratitude, that it it gives you a a more sense of motivation and a positive um, view on your life. So what I want you to do is I want you to write once a week, Let's give it a month. So, you know, that gives you four or five, you know, um, times to write. Um, But I want you to write what you're grateful for. And I know that sounds cliche and it sounds corny and blah, blah, blah. But you know what? It actually does work. And I have to say that in my own experience, I have written what I'm grateful for. And it does really make me think and, and changes my mindset about the woe is me that likes to creep in every now and then. And I am not the only one that woe is me creeps in for. Don't act like I'm the only one. <laughs> we all have <laughs> parties. Happens. Yeah, it does happen and it's human. And um, I think a lot of us, we get really hard on ourselves when, you know, uh, or on other people when the, the woe is me kicks in. Um, but we all do it. And, and as long as we can get ourselves out of it, writing is one way to do that. Well, I uh, challenge anyone who's writing to write 15 minutes a day. That's good. In the pursuit of their book. In the pursuit of their book. That's good. That's really good. I like it. So you guys hear that? That is your assignment. We'll be right back. Okay, so five tacos of cheese and a large soda. That's $10,012. Please drive around. Wait, 10000 what? It's obvious you're buzzed and driving. I've only had a few. I'm fine. Yeah, the food's 12 bucks, but getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Please drive around. Actually, just park and come in. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Meet former Dallas Cowboy Sherman Williams as he makes his way through Atlanta to Arlington, Texas. For the release of Crimson Cowboy, Peace Between the Lines. Don't miss your time to gain valuable insight on how to avoid the pitfalls of success. For appearance information, please go to info at palmerwilliamsgroup.org. Indoor baseball, anyone? Most party fouls are pretty dumb, but if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Learn more at ultimatepartyfoul.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. And so a new American industry has been born. Sensation Station Network. All right, welcome back to the Live Exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela, and I am joined by Caroline Smith, who is the executive editor of the prestigious Tandem Light Press. And award-winning. And award-winning Tandem Light Press. Yes. Uh, actually, Tandem Light Press is at about, what, 10 to 12 awards? Um, I think so. Maybe total. we're pushing 15. We might be. For, um, for books. So, you know, so there's, this, you know, children's books. There's a lot of different um, genres that we've got. The self-help, the fiction. Um, and so we have one self-help that's won an award. We have a fiction that's won an award. That's Sister Nadine's Ways. And then we, and I'll, see, I shouldn't be sitting here trying to name them because now I'm not going to remember all of them. <laughs> and then we have quite a few, several children's books that have won awards. I believe Boomer Be Nice. I Can Be. I Can Be. Mm-hmm. Um, a sh- uh, the Snake. Um, Ashaku. Ashaku and the Snake. Um, and the Black Snake. or this, Yeah. So, so we've got quite a few. If I missed your book... Shout us out. Let us know. We'll, we'll make sure we, we shout your book. But but several of those books have won numerous awards. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, you know, it, we're really proud about that. And and she has won an award, an award for um, editing? Yes. Didn't even mm-hmm. know that existed. I, yep. So <laughs> Ben uh, Ben Franklin Award for, um, awesome. for Independent Book pub- Publishing, excuse me. That's huge. Um, they give all kinds of awards. And so uh, one of my books won a Ben Franklin 
gold medal award in editing and design. I love it. So, and that's a pretty big, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. It was kind of awesome. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, um, you know, so I, I'm really proud about that. For those of you who don't know, I'm the president of Tandem Light Press, Caroline's executive editor. So we have been kind of making this thing happen together for the last four years. We're going into year five. Um, we have a lot of things coming up that we're going to be talking to you about. We've got writers workshops coming up um, every month and starting in January. January 20th mm -hmm. is write that book this year. Yes, yes. <laughs> write that book this year. It'll be happening in Atlanta or in Lawrenceville, Georgia. So I thought you were going to add something. Nope. So, and then we have a big conference coming up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and that is April 7th. And that is the Write, Pitch, Public public right pitch publish <laughs> <laughs> right pitch publish conference and so that will give you everything you need with regards to the process of writing your book pitching your book publishing your book as well as getting you connected um, with literary agents and editors so, so that you can have your manuscript reviewed so that you can pitch your book to the literary agents there's a lot so yes you want to know about that, I'm going to make sure that we, we give you information about that, too. So, very exciting, very exciting. So, um, one of the things that we was doing in the research was we, give, we were giving the psycholo psychological benefits of writing regularly. So, the first two, um, one of them was um, it can help you handle hard times. Um, writing and gratitude go hand in hand. The third one is writing and learning. So, just by the mere practice of writing something down, it enhances the learning process. I know that it certainly does for me. It does for me too. It's that creating that muscle memory of you mm -hmm. know writing, and and it's a very um, kinesthetic tactic yes. to get people to remember things because you write it and you see it. It doesn't help if somebody else writes it for you. Right, you have right. to write it yourself. <laughs> well, and I would think that it, it's even different than typing your notes, yes. which is very common in classes now. Mm -hmm. Is typing notes, and I really I like being able to write something. I'm still a hand <laughs> note writer. Yes. Yeah, Me too. I, I will be for the end till the end of time, probably. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even if it yes. takes longer. And I do that with my books. I I write the first draft, and I have to go through. And I don't know. There's just something about handwriting. Well, you know, the the interesting thing is what they teach us when they teach us how to edit is to edit by hand first. I yes, and, and I do that when I grade papers. Yes. yes, and so you print out the entire manuscript and you go through and you do it by hand mm -hmm. because you're you're likely to catch more errors mm -hmm. um, because our eyes read differently on a computer screen than they do when we're reading in print yes, because it's a digital that. version. Um, so I know I probably catch 10 to 15 percent more errors when I print a manuscript and go through it that way first right. and then take those changes and put them in track changes in Microsoft Word. So if all of you are wondering why it takes so long for your edits to be done. Because <laughs> it's being done thoroughly. That's why. <laughs> because we are thorough. If, if it's done correctly, yes. it should be thorough. Absolutely. And then I even go through a third time and make sure that everything makes sense. Okay. So, yes, yes there's so much to be said for writing notes or, you know, learning by writing. Right. Um, and it's just so invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. I, and you know what else helps, helps me? And it's not here in this article, but um, reading it out loud. Yes. It helps me tremendously. Yes. Because you don't really know how something sounds until you hear it. So, yeah. So that's for me. That's another step in my editing process is I, she, she has a manuscript. She's waiting for me to get to her. <laughs> it's coming. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I have read it out loud, and I've walked around the house, and I've pretend that it's it's an audio book, so I'll read it as if it's an audio book. I mean, I'm very serious about how this thing sounds and how it comes off. You know, I actually read things backwards sometimes I've when I heard edit, that. Um, and it helps catch punctuation glitches here and there okay. if something's tricky. Um, so I'll read it backwards. I've heard that. That's another good tip. And the last one before we go to break is um, is that writing. Helps us, I can't find it, but it basically helps us organize our thoughts. Yes. So when we're scatterbrained and we've got all this information coming at us, it helps us really kind of sort out what are we really thinking and to process. Yeah. So, all right. We'll be right back. Give us a call, 678-613-5857. Uncle Dan. Mom. Dad. If you store your guns properly, so not just anyone can get to them. I'll feel safer when I'm playing outside. Safer when walking home. Safer when my friends come over. As your neighbor, I'll feel safer. As a school teacher, I'll feel safer. 
We'll all feel safer. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. When I grow up, I want to be a new pair of blue jeans. When I grow up, I want to be a kid's first computer. I want to be a warm place on a cold I want to be a football stadium. I want to be a bike that races around the country. I want to be a bench on a forest trail. When I grow up, I don't want to be a piece of garbage. And if you recycle me, I won't be. Give your garbage another life. Recycle. Learn how at IWantToBeRecycled.org. Brought to you by Keep America Beautiful and the Ad Council. Great leaders aren't born. They're made. And not just anywhere. They're made in special places by special qualified trainers. In places like the Academy of Creative Coaching. The Academy of Creative Coaching is an international certification program with courses in health and wellness coaching, spiritual coaching, relationship coaching, executive coaching, life coaching, and cultural competency coaching. Courses are online, hybrid, or face-to-face. -face. The Academy of Creative Coaching is empowering coaches to empower the world. Make a positive change in yourself and the world. Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com. Welcome back to the Live Exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela, and we are talking writing, publishing, running your business. This is an, a day and age where we have so much at our own fingertips. Now, one thing that, that I'm, I'm, I have to dig a little bit more into this because I honestly should have dug into it. This spontaneously popped in my head right now. So before we get into a deep discussion about it, I do want to do my research. But I am uh, a little curious about the, the – was it the FCC? Um, so the changes that were made with regards to Internet providers and the, how much access um, different people are able to get and that kind of thing. Um, you know, so that could possibly change – significantly the way that we do business, you know, which is a little scary to me because um, I, when I think about countries that are a little bit more oppressive or a lot more oppressive, um, they're able to shut their internet down and not allow their citizens to access um, certain pieces of news, um, certain things that are happening in the media um, based on religious views, based on um, political climate. So that is the one thing, and I don't know how extreme this can get, but that's the first thing that crossed my mind when this thing came across. Do you have any more knowledge on this than I do? Because I, I, I know I didn't prep you for this question. <laughs> well, I mean, not not necessarily. Okay. I, I think right now there's not a whole lot that's going to change, okay. you know, in the in the in the immediate future. And I know that already it's going to go to a federal court. Um, I did hear and, that, yes. and they're going to, they're already, you know, I think, I don't even remember how many states so far, but there are several states that okay. have already kind of sued for, for not being able to have this happen. Okay. And there's definitely two schools of thought on it in terms of this is the government getting out of the internet more and allowing it to be kind of a free market capitalist system like right. we have already. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's what we have in our regular economy, why would we not include it in the internet? That's mm -hmm. one school. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other is open internet for all, obviously. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think think internet-based businesses are going to be hit the hardest. Right. And when we think about it, though, my, my, my one thought on this is that we really haven't had the internet around with business for that long mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things, um, maybe one generation. So we may right. just have to find that we do less internet-based marketing um, especially for small business. It's like, how do we do that? I don't how do we know. Radio programs. <laughs> this is true. TV ads, billboards. Yeah, you know, I mean, old true. school ways well, of doing marketing. Yeah, that but, but even like radio and these other media outlets are moving to yes, the internet. internet. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. So it's going to be really interesting to see where this goes. I'm not... The sky is falling yet yeah, about yeah. it um, because I think there's still a lot that... that is going to happen in the process and it hopefully won't even happen at all well and th that's kind of what my thought was when i heard that this was going you know that this was being challenged i thought okay well this probably isn't even gonna 
happen. I have had friends come to me and say, oh, my God, I'm not able to access this website. It's already started. And I'm like, I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's that quick. Not, <laughs> not quite yet. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. So it's not – don't panic. Don't panic yet. You know, but I do think um, it, it is one thing not to panic, and it's another thing to completely remain silent. I think right. that if there are concerns and there are things that are going to jeopardize our ability to, you know, to thrive as a business, then, yeah, absolutely we need to speak out and we need to get – educated on what is happening because so. potentially it will make it harder for smaller business people like netflix and google they're not going to have fine. any issues because you the, pay the fee yeah, you know and yeah. they, they will have that capital to be able to and do they that will probably own a part of it anyway right so. well they already do right, but right, right. <laughs> yes so. it'll just be so even be even bigger yeah than it yeah. is now but yeah i think it will be challenging and you know my mom just started a business and she was like, I have to get on Instagram and I have to do a Facebook page and I made my website and I'm thinking, mm, net neutrality, how is all of this going to affect yes, her? Exactly. Um, because she's so relying on the internet now. We all are really right, right, right. Um, to talk about our businesses and get all of that out there. So it's really interesting. And I mean, you're right. What you said earlier about social media has really completely changed the way we do things, yeah. not just from a personal perspective, but also from that business perspective. Right. So many people have moved to an internet only platform yeah. and don't market any other way. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. And and I and I have to say that I'm I'm guilty of that because I think about you know, a lot of and a lot of the authors that come to us is word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And and it's just because well such and such published with you guys and you know, you know, and it's we've kind of I think taking for granted that, you know, well, they'll come <laughs> and, they, and yep. they have, and they have, they have come. They have so, come. Well, yeah. and you know, the internet, at least, you know, things like Facebook and, and Instagram provide relatively free or very inexpensive ways of marketing. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about a billboard, that could be $1,200 that a lot of small businesses don't have the ability to shell out right. that quickly. Right. Um, and we have a lot of millennials who are starting businesses based on the fact that they don't have to pay a lot of upfront marketing costs right. because of the the internet yeah so it, yeah it's going to be really interesting to see where this entrepreneurial wave flows in yeah. terms of the internet and and open access to that yeah and i hope it's not disrupted it, 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 i mean we are so empowered right now mm -hmm. and i i want it to stay that way yeah, exactly <laughs> so, so we're, we're going to get into love notes love notes with dr pamela all right. So today's love note is it comes from a, a conversation that I had with um, a colleague who is interested in publishing a book. So this individual is, uh, you know, I've people who've heard me speak um, about publishing and the process and how absolutely particular we are about quality have heard me talk about industry standard. And I've learned about industry standard from this woman right here. <laughs> so I go and preach about it like like the, you guys need to understand this. And we're going to talk about that. Um, but one of the, I guess in some of our conversations, um, she has heard me express how adamant we are about making sure that the books that we produce are at standard. We have a lot of books out there that are what I would go ahead and call bootleg looking books. You know, they're just, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have seen the signs that are in various neighborhoods that say we buy ugly houses and they basically buy the house, refurbish it. We buy ugly books. We do because they're all books are not created equal. And so this particular individual was like, well, I already know what I want my book to look like. I know what my cover is going to look like. And yes, the things that I want violate the standard that you talk about, but I want to do it anyway. So um, that's just what I'm going to do. And so, <laughs> so the question on the table was, is this going to um, inhibit the, the sales and the, and the success of the book that this individual is publishing. And I will just give a little background. The individual is a business professional who is, um, that focuses on image. And so they have an idea of what the image of the cover, you know, should look like. Doesn't necessarily fall in line with what industry standard says, especially for a first time author. Um, things like uh, having your face on the cover mm -hmm. when you, nobody knows who you are, you know, things like that. So the question is, is this going to mess up the possible success of this book? Um, I had an answer that I'll give and then I'll let you. Okay. <laughs> my, my answer is that it depends on what your goals for the book are. You know, what are those goals? For me, my goal is Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> I want a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> I like that so goal. So I am aiming high um, in, with regards to the literary world. Now, I'm aiming high with regards to the literary world, but I'm not aiming high with regards to 
the business world, you know, and the, the, the speaking platforms and all of the gurus who, you know, have like the, um, the John Maxwell's of mm-hmm. the world. Like, of course I want John Maxwell money, but that's not really the love, the type of success I'm looking at having in my books. The type of success I'm looking at having is Pulitzer prize is sitting on Oprah's couch and her turning to page 84 and saying, Oh my God, I, <laughs> that's a, that's my goal. You get a book, and right, you get right. a book. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying that one is better than the other, or one is more legitimate than the other. I just know that that's what my goal is, and I know that the path to that particular goal um, is for a New York Times bestselling reviewer to read the book and say, Oprah. You got to check this out. Right. If he did it, if he picked up a book or she picked up a book and it's not industry standard, they're not calling Oprah. So, so that's, that's my answer. Right. What, what's, what's your thoughts? So a, a big reason that we tell, especially first time authors not to put, um, their image on the front of the book is we can't always, um, have anything to do with the quality of the photograph. So that's one issue okay. um, because you don't want to have a picture of yourself that's pixelated or the color's not right or what Which you're I wearing seen on the cover. is not right. <laughs> You've seen this yes. many times, even for about the author photos. Yes. Sometimes we'll say you need to take a different picture right. because this is not up to what we feel should be an author photo right. in the back of a book. Um, but also, if you are your brand, I think it would be appropriate mm-hmm. to have your picture on the front of the book. Right. Um, but... The caveat with that is maybe with something else, um, maybe not just you, because it comes off as a little bit egocentric mm-hmm. um, to have you be the focus of your book. The goal is that you want your reader to take away something from your book, not just you. Yeah. You don't want them to just have you in the book and nothing else. Because I'm what are they learning? Egocentric, because there's something I want to say about <laughs> that with content too. But go ahead. Yes, <laughs> um, but let's just take. I'm going to use an example. Um, Deepak Chopra is one of my favorite authors and he has a lot of books Mm -hmm. and he is a brand. He's created a brand that's largely around himself, but he and Oprah, you know, they're good friends. Mm -hmm. I listen to their meditations. Um, and his picture is like this big on only a couple of covers Mm. because he doesn't focus on him. Right. Um, he focuses on other topics. And so, you know, the, the, his covers tend to be galaxy like or mm-hmm. you know something meditative or a butterfly or change or transformation or something like that right um so i think that it depends on the purpose of your book mm-hmm. who your target audience is a lot of the content um it wouldn't make any sense for a fictional author to have their picture on the cover of a book <laughs> i've seen it we have yeah, seen, I've it. seen it <laughs> Um, you know, and, and this, this, well, not that the people listening can see, but the, this pose is really popular, like with arms crossed, you know, leaning to one side. Um, you know, we do know a power couple who has written a couple of books Mm -hmm. and it's appropriate for them to be on the covers of their books because Mm -hmm. they are their brand. Yes. So, but you know, you have to kind of get your readers to know you a little bit. So for me, the first book, I would say, let's not do it. But mm-hmm. then once you've started creating that brand and, you know, figuring out where you're going with everything, maybe then it would be a possibility. Right, right. So that may scare some of you off, but that's okay. <laughs> but no, but that's, um, but it's really important. And we're going to get into a little bit more detail about what this whole industry standard thing means. Um, and so just stay with us. And I know you've got questions. So sh- sound off with your questions. and We'll be happy to answer them. We'll be right back. <laughs> Well, you'll see what happens. Sensation Station Network. Exchange. We are at the top of our second hour. We are talking publishing and writing and just being an independent, successful business owner. And I have joining me here, Caroline Smith. She is the executive editor of Tandem Light Press. And we are here as Unified Front to talk publishing and make sure that you really understand how this industry works and what it is that you need to do to be as successful as possible. Give us a call. We'd love to hear your feedback. We'd love to get your questions. The number is 678 678- Six one three five eight five seven. We've got an active Facebook Live chat happening 
on um, Dr. Pamela's Facebook page, but also go to Sensation Station Network's Facebook page to follow along with the chat there. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about um, an industry standard. We had um, our love note topic was basically about whether or not, you know, you can violate industry standard based on what your particular interests are or your just your desires are um, for your own book and whether or not that will hinder your success. And so... Well, and, and the answer to everything in publishing, because people ask us all the time, you know, all kinds of questions. Can this be in my book? Or yes. is, you know, how, how much does it cost? That's another big one. And I'm sure we'll get into that. But the answer to everything in reality is it depends. It depends. <laughs> it depends. And yes. I say that all the time to so right. many people. And, and everybody wants a clear-cut answer, but that's really just not possible. Because, right. again, it depends on your target audience. It depends on the content of your book. It depends on how much marketing effort you're going to put behind it. Right. All of those things come into play. And so that's why we really get to know our authors because we have to understand this isn't just a one-time thing. Right. You can go and self-publish a book and have it and you have it in your hands and that's great and 10 people buy it and your family, your family. And, and you're done <laughs> yeah. and you have a book. Right, right. Um, but if you want to take it to the next level, then you use a publisher like we are, which mm -hmm. is we call ourselves a hybrid publisher, mm -hmm. postmodern publisher, mm -hmm. um, where we're a little bit of self-publishing and a little bit of traditional publishing. Right. And so what we really do is kind of guide you through the process, but there's so many factors that we need to understand before we can really make your book as effective as it needs to be. Um, so it really, it, the answer is it depends. Yeah, it does. It <laughs> we does. need t-shirts. Right, no, it depends. And, and that was the, the, the feedback that I gave um, my colleague when, you know, they were saying, you know, well, you know, I just heard that you, you wouldn't publish if I do this. And I said, well, you know, it's not black and white. It's not right. just it has to be this way or that way. We're, we'll give you feedback on what we know the success of, you know, your book could be, but it's going to be based on what your goals are. Right. If your goal is not to get a Pulitzer Prize, then, you know, we'll still publish with as much quality as possible, but we may not go in the same direction in terms of marketing and in terms of what the cover should look like. I mean, because that, that conversation is going to be based on who your audience is. Right. Absolutely. You know? And, so. you know, that, that also, critics are mean. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> go there. Please tell them about the critics. Uh, critics are away. mean. Critics uh -huh. are very mean. And, yes. you know, what we um, strive to do as a publishing company for you as well is to get your book out there and do some galley copies and get them read by people other than us yes. and other than your mom and your dad and your English teacher. Um, <laughs> we so get a lot can, of people say they have their English teacher. Yes, that, a lot. <laughs> that's editing. Um, <laughs> that, that we, so we get real reader feedback uh -huh. um, and real critic feedback and that's very important and some authors decide to change their entire book because of it mm -hmm. and some authors say well, I don't care I'm just going to go ahead and publish it because it's not really for them anyway right but that's something very important to keep in mind is um, you know if you have your mom or your dad or your friends and your family read your book that's great and they can give good feedback but are they your target audience right because often they're not mm -hmm. let's say you're writing a, a crime novel like Patricia Cornwell style or something um, and nobody in your family reads crime. They would not be your target audience. Right. They're not the people that are going to give you the best feedback about this type of book. So we need to send it to people that are familiar with exactly. that kind of book um, who are going to be able to give you good feedback and say, well, the plot was lacking a little bit here. I figured out who the murderer was in page three. You know, I <laughs> right, mean, right. so that we, we understand that. exactly the pros and the cons of the book, mm -hmm. but, but they're mean and they're not, not all of them, but, <laughs> but many of them tend to be really harsh. And you can't make that go away. You know, once you get that harsh review, um, you know, publishers weekly, it, they're pretty tough. They are. And, um, you know, I've read reviews from them and it's like, ouch. And that doesn't go away. No. You Google, you Google that book, a publisher's weekly review may likely come up. Um, and so, Amazon reviews, you know, they, they're there. So it's, it's, just and you so can't important. delete them. You cannot delete the reviews you don't like, you guys. So, so we want to prevent that from happening and, and make sure we do all of the criticism in the forefront and get yes. that from other people before you put it out into the world. So we'll be right back. Stay with us on the live stream. Okay, so five tacos, a cheese, and a large soda. That's $10,012. Please drive around. Wait, $10,000 what? It's obviously.
guess you're buzzed and driving. I've only had a few. I'm fine. Yeah, the food's 12 bucks, but getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Please drive around. Actually, just park and come in. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. You use tearless baby shampoo because it's gentle on your baby's eyes. You make sure his toys don't have any sharp edges. You always test the bath water to make sure it's not too hot. You taught her what to do when the smoke alarm goes off. You make sure she wears a helmet when she rides her bicycle. You put on his sunscreen, even when he's embarrassed his friends will see. You do so much to keep your child safe. But are you using the right car seat for your child? Is your child facing the right way in the car seat? Is the seat too big or too small? How do you know when it's time to move your child into the next type of seat? Car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. For information on the right seat for your child, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. That's safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Having trouble finding Connor's middle school? Would you like directions? No. Why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Finding lowest airfare to Istanbul. No, I'm, I'm tired of fighting with him over homework. Home, walk, restaurant. Need a review? No, I need help. He's very smart, but his mind wanders. He's disorganized. Organized. I think I understand. Oh, good. Finding best potatoes for French fries. No! Russet, fingerling, Yukon uh, gold. Why don't you understand me? Sorry, I was trying to show how Connor feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. For the one in five kids with learning and attention issues, this is what life can feel like. Explore understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues designed to help your child thrive in school and in life. Understood.org, because understanding is everything. Brought to you by understood.org and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Terry Crews, actor, former football player, and father of five. I'm also an expert on drama. There's the good kind that comes with having a house full of kids, and there's silly drama like the drama around my percolating pectorals. And then there's the drama you can skip. Skip the drama that comes with not having your high school diploma or equivalency. Find free adult education classes near you and finish your diploma. Visit finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. And lead the drama to actors like me. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ed Council. Election. Lack of diversity. Gas prices. Michael Jackson. Trending topics. All right. So a trending. Um, so I don't know how many of you have um, paid attention, but there. this was kind of interesting to me because the commuter train um, going from Seattle to Portland, first time running, first time running. Three people were killed and countless others were injured um, after it cascaded or careened off of a bridge around 7.30 a.m. The authority said the, Spain, the, tree, the train was speeding 80 miles an hour in a 30-mile-hour zone when it derailed. Now, I didn't. I knew it was going 80. I did not know that it was only supposed to be going 30. I didn't know that it was supposed to be going that slowly either. But, wow. you know, I used to live out there. Oh, that's right. So yeah. when I heard about it, I messaged all of my friends. And I'm like, are you okay? And one of my um, best friend's husband is a state patrolman. Um, in Washington, and thankfully he wasn't working that day. Wow. But she told me that people were leaving three hours early to go home because five is it, and five was completely shut down. Oh, my goodness. And that's what the train wow. landed on. Um, and so they were, you know, trying to leave um, to get home because there's no back roads. Wow. Like, there's no, there's no oh, other way to go because you're going through potentially into Olympia, which is mountainous, and so five is, that's it. That's right. all there is. Wow. And, and so, that, I mean, that train was supposed to be a great you know, thoroughfare. It was, it was gonna, so they actually came to visit me this summer and they rode that train mm. from Tacoma, well, Seattle to Portland. Okay. Um, but this, the new version of it or this new thing was only supposed to shave off like 10 or 15 minutes from the ride. Oh. So I don't know if it was really worth it. Yeah. But when I heard about it, I was like, it's like the Titanic. Wow. Nobody's going to ever want to go on it ever again, even if they get it fixed. Is that the same train we were talking about? So the Amtrak has this this scenic um, 
route from right. like you know the the west coast you're on the coast the whole time and it's this most beautiful um coastal train ride was is that the same route i think it probably is okay i don't know if it goes a different direction because this one goes from seattle to portland okay and that may go further on the west coast or okay. like closer oh, to the I coast see. i got it yeah but um yeah i mean it's yeah. Well, because one of the things that Caroline and I have big ideas, all kinds of big ideas all the time. <laughs> and one of them was to um, a sponsor an author to take a road trip on in the Amtrak, actually on that particular route that I was just mentioning on the West Coast. Um, I can't remember how long the ride is. but It's like five days, I think. A five-day trip. And, and it was um, basically a traveling writer scholarship that you know that we're and it's not over we'll, we'll probably still do it um but it's the opportunity to allow a writer to do a cross-country trip or a coastal trip and write on that trip and um and so yeah i want to do that so bad i, I would know, really be so love much to, fun yes so um so keep you know stay tuned for that because that's something that's coming i'm supposed to be talking about trending topics okay sean combs also known as puffy aka diddy I don't know where he landed yet. Where is he now? I, I, have no, I can't keep up. Okay. I can't keep up. <laughs> well, he made a plea via Twitter and Instagram on Sunday that he would like to purchase the Carolina Panthers. And I think he also actually called them the South Carolina Panthers and or something. And, yeah, that didn't go well with <laughs> No, no, that's not Just a really Carolina. good foot in the door. No, no, no. you got to do your research. You got to do your research. So Carolina Panthers. Um, and they came up for sale after the owner announced that he would sell his 48% stake in the team amid sexual and racial harassment allegations, which is something else I would love to talk to Caroline, um, have her chime in on. <laughs> we may get to that. Um and also, um, Colin Kaepernick and Steph Curry have also expressed interest in um, joint ownership with this purchase. So I think it'll be interesting because there are very few owners that are African American, and they're also for Colin Kaepernick and Steph Curry to jump in would be awesome because they they're athletes, and, right? You they're know, players. Yeah, and it yeah. would make sense for athletes to have a stake in. You know, the arena. Now, I, I understand Steph Curry. I'm not saying I think he's a football player. I, I know he's a basketball player. But he wants to <laughs> he wants to be in it as well. And I just think that that's great. I would love to see it happen. It's like a so. player co-op owned yeah. team. That would be kind of cool, actually. I just actually. think that should be happening. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're playing and they should have stock in it. It's just like a company offering stock to their employees. employees. You right. Know? Yeah, they, they exactly. I think they really should be part owners as well. That's really interesting. I like that idea. Yeah. Falcons so. players, listen up. No, just yes. kidding. I love, I love Arthur Blank. Um, but I, I think that's a really interesting idea because, you know, a lot of coaches, obviously, have play, been players. Right, right. Um, But I, I don't know that there have been a lot of owners that are players. Right. So that would be a really interesting thing to have happen. Mike. And to have them chime in on decisions yeah, for the league. Yeah, it might change the sport a little bit. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> change huh so <laughs> and then the last one um that I'll, I'll touch on here is um the winter olympics now i am olympics i love the olympics <laughs> i love sports and competition i don't care what it is i don't understand half of what those olympic sports are in the winter i really don't but i love it anyway you know they're on the ice and they're scooting this little disc around or they're I don't know, but I love it. <laughs> so, um, so this year for the Winter Olympics, there'll be a couple of firsts. Um, the uh, Nigeria will have a women's bobsled team. Nigeria, the Jamaica, we yeah. are the bobsled team. I love and, Cool Runnings. It's like one of my say, favorite movies of all time. Yeah, and it's just you know, it was just as shocking when Jamaica had yeah, her. You know, exactly. So I was like, what? And then. Um, Mamie Biney became the first black woman to qualify for a U.S. Olympic speed skating team. Um, and then the third thing, which is not on here, is uh, that Russia is not going to be participating um, because of government-supported drug Yes, use. doping. What? Yeah. They, they've always had the best, most elite athletes. Yes. So I'm not sure it really surprises me yes. that they're not going to be there. Right, right. Um, but, yeah, it's going to be – I mean – the, the playing field may not necessarily – well, it will be level because they won't be there, but right. everybody's competition is always Russia during yes, the Winter Olympics. Absolutely. So yeah. that will be really interesting to see what happens. Yeah. Woo. All right. We'll, we'll be right back. <laughs> 
Vince Lombardi once said that it's hard to be aggressive when you're confused. Some of us think that taking our lives to the next level, both personally and professionally, is a confusing and complicated process. Guess what? It's not, and I can prove it. My book, Truisms, will show you how living your life by rules that are so self-evident and obvious, you'll say, I knew that. This powerful yet short, detailed bestseller is on sale right now, under $10. Go to michaelmcfadden.com. That's michaelmcfadden.com, and let Truisms help you to the next level. Listen, as a hiring manager, I've got to tell you, the best job candidate isn't always the typical candidate. Sometimes they're a grad of life. Meet the grads of life. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. Sometimes the best candidates aren't the ones you're used to. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Driving has a rhythm all its own. Don't wreck it with a text. Before you get behind the wheel, silence your phone. Or better yet, designate a texter. For more text-free driving tips, visit StopTextStopRex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. All right, welcome back to the Live Exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela, and we are talking publishing. And speaking of publishing, I have to mention this because not only am I a writer and a publisher, but I'm also a researcher. And <laughs> and recently, I think it was last week, or yeah, yeah last, last week, week um, the CDC was gifted with a list of forbidden words <laughs> that they're not allowed to use. Now, I have since heard clarifications, because it's interesting, when I first heard that you're not allowed to use these words, the very article that wrote it quoted, um, who was, I don't want to misspeak here, but it quoted, um, I, I don't know where it is, but they said that we will, they basically used one of the forbidden words in their quote. They basically said, you know, evidence-based evidence is not, is one of the terms right. that's not supposed to be used. And so they said, we will continue to use evidence-based. <laughs> I said, I love it, I love it. Because I was wondering, you know, what's the consequence of not, if you do violate and you say one of the forbidden words, and by the way, some of the forbidden words, um, we have fetus, transgender, vulnerable, entitlement, diversity, evidence-based, and science-based. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure, to be honest, what to make of this whole list, because as a person who deals with words for a living, um, I don't really like the word forbidden, yeah. because, you know, Verboten was, you know, I took German for three years, and I lived there for a little while, and that's where a lot of other things started. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the banning of words is first, and then the banning of books happens, and then, yes. you know, it's a slippery slope from there. I know that they've given other words to be used instead of, or in place of, in some cases, mm -hmm. um, they've said... You know, I don't even know exactly which one they are. It's something about what the society wishes or something. Uh, right. I, I, this I don't is, look for the exact. This is, we, we can't go with what science wants. We have to go with what society wants. But the CDC is science-based. Yes. So I'm, I don't know. It was just really, um, my feeling is that there's going to be a lot of papers written in the next couple of years or months that have all of these all words, of the in, words them. in the title. <laughs> Okay, we're going to have a publication that says the vulnerable entitlement of looking the at the diversity and the transgender yes, community. fetuses <laughs> based on the evidence-based and science-based study. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I, am I in trouble because I just used all these terms? Well, I, I think they're only supposed to be for the scientific the, community. Got it. Okay. But, you know, I mean, I, Yeah. I, I don't. I'm, I'm a little bit speechless on that one, to be perfectly honest. Because <laughs> I'm not going to tell a, an author you can't use these words. Right. Well, that's not necessarily true, actually. Well, for different reasons, though. Right. You like, know. like there's things that are just inappropriate. Yeah. Um. Or there's things that you know we we ask all of our authors if they talk about anybody in a pejorative or negative sense. Right. And so those are for legal reasons usually. Right. Right. Um, no, and she actually recommended that I add some curse words to my books. So I did. She's not trying to censor. No, no, not at all. <laughs> um. But you know, you just don't. 
words are words yeah. and words have a purpose have a and purpose. words have meaning. Yeah. And so if you need the most accurate term, then you don't say you can't use this. Right. Right. So I, I don't know. I think, it, um, I'm sure there's probably some people in the scientific community that are going, I'm just going to put it in anyway. Yeah. I mean, what if I'm doing a study on transgender fetuses? I mean, well, they're not anymore. <laughs> they're going to have to call them something else. Oh, yeah. So that's, that, I do, that's just so interesting, but you know, that certainly has an impact on the science world and the world of, you know, publishing yeah. in general. Yeah. I mean, when so. you start, when the government cart starts coming in and saying, now, this is just science-based right mm -hmm. now, but what if it happens on in other areas of publishing? Oh, yeah, and in religious arenas and, you know, all of that. So yeah. um, very interesting. But what I did read was that these are – they're forbidden, but it was more of a recommendation. Right. Um, so the, the, the headlines say that they've been told to avoid – these seven banned words. To me, that sounds like a contradiction and very confusing it language. Avoid these banned words. Yes. So do we just avoid them or are they actually banned? And is there a consequence for using them? Yeah, that will be interesting yeah. to find out as well. <laughs> yes. So anyway, yeah, that, that's the CDC. That's the thing going on there. So, um, and they are not, it, uh, from what I gathered, they are not in support of this level of censorship. So, all right. <laughs> How do you transition from, from that, that into something to... <laughs> else? <laughs> where were we before that? Well, you know, we were, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know where we were before that. We were writing. We were talking about writing. Oh, we industry about... standards. Yes. That was what we were going to talk about when we came back from the break. Industry standards. So what is industry standard? You know, and every industry has their standard. Um, they have, you know, a standard for, you know, what is appropriate and what is acceptable for this field. Um, the FCC, for example, they have certain things that I can't say, you know, at, you know, being on the radio. If I am somebody who, you know, likes to drop F-bombs all the time and, you know, there's some regulations that, right. you know, that we need to follow. The same is for publishing. So I would love for you to just kind of give everybody an idea of what this is. Okay. So if you remember back to the days of high school, um, when you had to write papers based on MLA or APA. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about in terms of industry standards for publishing. Mm -hmm. um, and really it comes from this giant book, and I, I should have brought it with me. I almost did. <laughs> um, it's sitting on my desk, of course. Um, it's this 10, or I'm sorry, 1,021-page book, um, and it's called the Chicago Manual of Style. And what it does is it basically lays out how we approach publishing. Mm -hmm. And they are standards, they're guidelines, they're not necessarily rules, although most editors are pretty inflexible on them most of the time. Um, so they have things like grammar and punctuation and how to use an ellipse and when it's appropriate. Um, things that you would see, how to cite certain research, mm -hmm. um, how to lay out a book, what order do all the parts go in. Um, and so this is basically our publishing Bible. This mm -hmm. is what we rely on to tell us what we should and shouldn't do. Um, sometimes things are okay and Chicago is really flexible on it. Sometimes they're not okay. But what happens is everybody in the industry uses these standards. And if they're not used, it's really, really apparent. Yeah. And I can turn to a copyright page or to the title page of a book and tell you if it's following these standards or not. And typically if it's not, it's because it's self-published and the author didn't know better. Or it's because the editor um, may have been a, just a freelance editor and looking for proofreading type things, but not known exactly what's in the, the Chicago Manual of Style. So it's definitely, there's an art to it. You yeah. know, editing is an yeah. art. Um, and it's something that, that I take a lot of pride in. And I think most, a lot of editors, you, you know, and, and there's different kinds, and we can maybe talk about that at some point. But proofreading is just going through and looking for grammar, spelling, and punctuation errors. Mm -hmm. um, what I do is I make sure that there's no legal issues, uh, which Chicago lays out, you know, what's libel, what's defamation, what's okay to be talked about, things like that. There's a, a copyright infringement. There's a whole huge chapter on that. Um, and so these are things that we don't want to do to get in trouble from a legal perspective. Um, but also there's considerations like, you know, um, Chicago doesn't really like commas very much. And some authors love to write with commas. Yeah. And what so that that's... third comma called? The last one, the when you're doing a list and then there's the last one and people... Oh, the Oxford comma. The Oxford comma. Yes, like, Chicago like says that we should use the Oxford okay, comma. I like the Oxford comma. We always comma. use the Oxford comma. <laughs> um, MLA doesn't like the Oxford comma. So okay. this is something like, 
I had bacon, comma, eggs, and toast for breakfast. And MLA would omit the comma between the eggs and toast. Right. Chicago says that we put in the comma because we're making a list of three different things. Otherwise, it seems like the eggs are on the toast. Right. And there's so many funny and hilarious memes and, you know, things online about the Oxford comma. So you can just Google it and look at images if you want to. Um, But, you know, there's a friend of mine asked me last night. Would you ever use a fourth or a period after an ellipsis? And I said, yeah, it depends on the situation. But it's in quoting. And she said, the reason this came up is because of the crawl on Star Wars. (laughs) There's four (laughs) periods at the end. And I said, technically, that's grammatically incorrect. Okay. So my feeling is they probably did it in the first one. And nobody caught it or yeah. said anything. And then for consistency's sake, yeah, they've consistent. just used a fourth ever since then. Okay. But it is technically grammatically incorrect. Okay. So wow. these are things that Chicago tells us. Right. And it's important. And so when we come back, we're going to go to break right now. But, you know, I'm going to talk. We're going to talk about why it's important to know this kind of stuff. Yeah. Or to, to, to know somebody who knows this stuff. Yes. So stay with us. <laughs> you don't usually get a stock tip from a 16-year-old. But I'm here to tell you about a different kind of stock. It's called Better Futures, a stock for social change that's not about making money. Instead, you invest to help students like me go to college. This is beyond a simple donation. It's the opportunity for America to invest in its kids and take an active stake in the future of the country. The return on your investment is in money. What you get back is knowing you protected our potential. So one day, that potential can grow up to become surgeons and architects, executives and engineers. People who can change the future just by being a part of it. My name is Alicia, and I am your dividend. Invest in better futures with UNCF. Visit uncf.org slash invest. Our mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. A public service announcement brought to you by UNCF and the Ad Council. Great leaders aren't born, they're made. And not just anywhere. They're made in special places by special qualified trainers in places like the Academy of Creative Coaching. The Academy of Creative Coaching is an international certification program with courses in health and wellness coaching, spiritual coaching, relationship coaching, executive coaching, life coaching, and cultural competency coaching. Courses are online, hybrid, or face-to-face. The Academy of Creative Coaching is empowering coaches to empower the world. Make a positive change in yourself and the world. Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com. My savings are gone. Okay, where were they last? Here, right before I spent them on the vacation to Aruba. Weird. Not weird. Not saving now means no money later. For free ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Adopt U.S. Kids presents Multiple Choice Parenting. You accidentally cut your daughter's bangs unevenly. Do you, A, line things up a centimeter from her hairline? Man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. No, 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 no. Sweatbands are so hot right now. Everyone's wearing them. Like. That basketball player and that other basketball player. B, get spiritual. Mom, where did all the mirrors go? A reflection could never capture our true selves. Huh? Beauty is within? Um. C, look on the bright side. Less time blow drying, more time texting. Or D, show empathy. Mom, you really don't have to. Ta-da! Twinsies. I kind of love it. (laughs) As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt U.S. Kids, and the Ad Council. Okay, so five tacos, a cheese, and a large soda. That's $10,012. Please drive around. Wait, 10000 what? It's obvious you're buzzed and driving. I've only had a few. I'm fine. Yeah, the food's 12 bucks, but getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Please drive around. Actually, just park and come in. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. In the interest of science. 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 Okay, so our second hour of science. Um, this is really interesting, and, I, and it goes into our 
um, you know, just social media and how important social media has become um, for us, in whether it's for business, personal, um, regardless. So in a panel discussion at Stanford University recently, um, the former vice president of user growth for Facebook, that's Chamath Pali Haptita, described what he calls a reprogramming of our brains. Our brains are being reprogrammed, you guys. Um, and this is as a result of social media engagement. Um, so I know that we've kind of thought this can't be good for us. This is probably, you know, I'm addicted. Why do I wake up in the morning and roll over and pick up my phone? And I know all of us have had those guilt trips like, I really i am doing too much with the social media. Well, it is absolutely accurate, your thoughts. You need to go with those thoughts before those thoughts stop happening. Um, but basically what it says here is we have become dependent on the affirmations that we, that we receive from likes and loves and positive comments that come on our post. So we really, by dependence, we're, we're addicted to that. We're addicted to getting those likes. And if you post something, post something today and don't get any likes. Post your child and get no likes. <laughs> How are you going to respond to that? Like, excuse me? Yeah. Did you, did you start tagging people? <laughs> yep. Nope, people aren't seeing it. Right, right. They must not see it. So... So um, this type of dependence has the effect of a dopamine that offers a temporary high, often in the absence of a genuinely enduring positive sense of self. So even if, you know, you, well, let's just forget about the last part. But, we'll, but it's basically, it's, it creates a dependence. And, and it gives that level, that kind of high that we get from dopamine. Yep. So this is, you know, classic conditioning. You know, psychologists have been studying this for years, um, and it's the whole the Skinner did it with the rat, right? Put with the food reinforcement. Uh-huh. So they push a button, and then the food comes. Right. And so they they learn, and we're basically learning the same thing. We post something, we get likes. We post more things, we get more likes. It makes us feel good. Yes. So you know, it's it's crazy um, to think that we have become addicted to this social media platform that really hasn't even existed that long, number one. That that kills me all the time. I'm like, it hasn't even been around that long. Um, but I have taken the Facebook app off of my phone and I, I did try that now for about two months. <laughs> I try now to use it once my kids are in bed. Okay. Um, because Smart. I don't also want them seeing me on my phone all the time. Because I'm conscious now. Yes. I try to be conscious of the fact that they're seeing me not engaging with them and on my phone right, instead. Right. Um, so, you know, we used to say that we had people who are couch parents, but now I think we have people <sighs> who are phone parents. Yes. Um, yeah. Who just kind of let their kids do whatever, mm-hmm. and they, you know, used to sit on the couches, but now it's we're on the couches and on our phone. Yeah, and, and the kids are on the couch doing their own yeah, social media. Yeah, YouTube, <laughs> tablets, you know, whatever. And yeah. I did, I will admit that I finally let my 10-year-old have Instagram. She just got Instagram, too. Mine. We both have 10-year-olds. We both have 10-year-olds. Yes. Um, we lead parallel lives. It's yes. very strange. Um, and um, have one more baby. Yeah. <laughs> you can have mine. Yeah. Um, you know, that was a big decision for me, yeah. you know, is whether or not she can have this because all of her friends are on it. Um, and I try not to be like a helicopter mom and check who her friends are. And we've had conversations, and I know she'll make good decisions. Right. Um, but and, – and we have a really open form of communication – but, you know, I'm afraid of the things she might be seeing of, you know, when I, when I first anything. got on it Instagram, it yeah. could be anything. Yeah. When I first got on Instagram, it was really artsy. Like people were taking photos of abstract things right. and posting them and whatever. Right. And then it's kind of created this after, especially after Facebook purchased it, has kind of created this like lots of skin showing, weird hashtags. <laughs> like you might search a Disney hashtag and you have no idea what you're going to oh, yeah, come yeah. up with. Yeah. Same with YouTube. Yeah. Um, so you've taken something that was pretty innocuous to begin with Mm -hmm. and has become predatory in some ways. Um, So, yeah, I'm... Yeah, that, sorry, I got off on a tangent. <laughs> no, there. no, that was. I mean, that's good. I mean, because that that's what's happening, and and it's it's really scary when I hear things like our brains are being Rewired. reprogrammed. Right? Yeah. It's wow, you know, and I don't know that we understand exactly how impactful that actually is. You know, it's that it's almost creating that need for attention. That, that we seek that approval of others. And we, we always try to say, like, we're being non judgmental and things like that. But you get on Facebook and you're judging. Oh, That's my gosh. exactly that Facebook is a judging platform. It, it is. It is. Yes. And, and I'm guilty. Cause I'm I, like, I am too. What in the world is she wearing? <laughs> Anger. <No>. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yes, and you know, and so we do, and so it is. I would imagine that it is also programming our brains to feel liberated to judge, to say, right. you know, and and to feel to, entitled to to have this filterless existence where we don't really have to filter what we say because yeah. we can say it on Facebook, and we might not ever say that in real life, right? Or now people may right. take it out of the, the social media platform and take it somewhere else. But also, don't you notice now that with reactions having changed, <laughs> that you're like, why didn't I get more loves? <laughs> You know, so like we're we're not only reprogramming this like we're raising the bar. Yeah, yeah. Like, what? Well, thirty four people liked it, but only two people loved yeah, it. Yeah. What the heck? Yeah, I, I, and I, I'm guilty. I will be full disclosure. <laughs> Yesterday, I did that. I was like, why'd that person just hit like and not love? <laughs> so dang self righteous. That is hilarious. Yes. So, <laughs> with regards to the, another thought came to mind, um, th that we're less filtered. And, you yes. know, so, I have a, a Facebook friend who posted, um, a, and basically used a curse word, you know, used the F word, and, you know, family and friends replied shocked, like, I mean, your message was great, but when you threw that word in there, it just kind of killed the message and a lot of feedback like that. And and she was really offended by that because she felt like, I can say whatever I want to say. You know, this is my platform. If you don't like it, I'll unfriend you, you know. Right, right. And, and so her next um, post said something about why is it that we are so oppressed that we can't say what we want to say and say curse words and things like that. And, you know, why is everybody always shocked when they hear a curse word. And I said, well, because it's a sh curse word. And it has, because you know, her point was words are words. It right. doesn't matter. Words are words. And, um, and my point to her was, well, because they're curse words and they're designed for shock value, that's what they are. But I think that when we, I think, so that just made me think of the, the less filtered. You know, the, the, it, it's not as shocking for her because this is, you know, the regular. She's trying to be authentic. Right. But she may not be that way because we all have different personas around family and right. things, you know, it, professionally. And that was exactly her point. And yes. so she's crossed what they perceive as that boundary. Right. So she's being herself and right. feeling like she can be herself or should be herself. And her family is like, oh, but that's not who we see when we, we see you. That we was hear you that was precisely what she was frustrated about. She says, why are people putting me in a box? And so, and my response was, well, here's why. Right. Because it's shocking. But you know? she also probably but, puts herself in that box. If she's, if they're that shocked, then that means she's not being her authentic self around right, them, right, too. Right. And so, that's what she said, that she's starting to just be her. Be her. Right. You know. Yep. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. Okay. Balance challenge. Keeping your balance <laughs> with Dr. Pamela. Dr. Pamela. Okay, so our balance challenge, I like the one that Caroline said better, so we're going with that one. <laughs> Caroline is issuing this week's balance challenge. Okay, this week's balance challenge is actually something that I give to my authors when they're working on a book, and that is to write for 15 minutes a day in pursuit of your book. So that could mean that you just write notes about what you want it to be about. It could mean you jot down an outline. It could mean that you actually sit and write. Um, but you can do anything in 15 minutes a day. Yes. And you'd be shocked at how much content you have in a month after only writing for 15 minutes a day. And if you're stumped on not being able to write something, then jot down marketing ideas. Yeah. Jot anything as long as it's in the pursuit of your book. So it doesn't have to be content for the book. It just has to be something to do with the book. Right. It could even be research bullet points or something that, you know, if you're doing research for your book. Um, and so 15 minutes a day in pursuit of your book. I love it. I love it. There's your challenge. There's your challenge. <laughs> Leaders aren't born, they're made. And not just anywhere, they're made in special places by special qualified trainers in places like the Academy of Creative Coaching. The Academy of Creative Coaching is an international certification program with courses in health and wellness coaching, spiritual coaching, relationship coaching, executive coaching, life coaching, and cultural competency coaching. Courses are online, hybrid, or face-to-face. -face. The Academy of Creative Coaching is empowering coaches to empower the world. Make a positive change in yourself and the world. Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com. My savings are gone. Okay, where were they last? Here, right before I spent them on the vacation to Aruba. Weird. Not weird. Not saving now means no money later. For free ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. So...
I'm a dog, and I just got adapted by this new human guy, and I'm starting to wonder how he got along without me. I mean, okay, something as simple as walking around the block. He's got this leash thing, and he puts me on one end and him on the other, and I'm just taking him around. I, I think he's afraid of getting lost. Without that leash and me guiding him along, I don't think he'd find his way back home. But it's kind of cute. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. Uncle Dan? Mom? Dad? If you store your guns properly, so not just anyone can get to them. I'll feel safer when I'm playing outside. Safer when walking home. Safer when my friends come over. As your neighbor, I'll feel safer. As a school teacher, I'll feel safer. We'll all feel safer. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. My savings are gone. Okay, where were they last? Here, right before I spent them on that vacation to Aruba. Weird. Not weird. Not saving now means no money later. For free ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. This is big business. This is the American way. Live Exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela. I'm joined by Caroline Smith, and we are talking about well, we're t- <laughs> we're going to talk about everything. <laughs> it's a free for all. It's a free for all. Um, you know, I guess it all comes down to expression. We're talking about expression. <laughs> People express themselves <laughs> online via publishing through the CDC. You know, all expression. So, <laughs> if you guys have any questions, give us a call, 678-613-5857. Um, as far as editing, what would you say is one of the most common questions that you get from authors that you think? Um, as far as, people, like, the actual editing? Because usually well, the most common question is, how much is it? Yes, and that's a good question. That's, that's usually the big question. I actually, I went live a couple of weeks ago, and I was just talking random writing, publishing, and that was the question that came up, how much for editing? And I don't know if I gave a good answer or not. So <laughs> what would you say? It depends. It depends. Everything in this an- business, the answer is it depends. And the reason it depends is because it depends on the type of editorial that's needed for the book. And really briefly, that would be something like proofreading would be really inexpensive, depending on how long the book is. Right. Um, something like a line edit is going to go through and make sure that the content is there, um, that the transitions are there between paragraphs. Um, That's also kind of content editing. We call it content editing as well. And then you have something that's more like developmental editing where the whole book needs to be overhauled, where most of the content is there, but it may need some reorganization. Mm. Some of it may need to be taken out. Sometimes we might need to add more to it. Um, That's kind of an overhaul. And and that tends to be (laughs) more expensive than just your regular proofread because that can happen pretty quickly. But a developmental edit takes a lot more time and consideration on the time of uh, on the part of the editor. Um, So you know you're looking at anywhere between um, some editors charge per page, some Mm -hmm. charge per word. Um, It really depends on what they're doing. It depends on how much research is in your book, if any, that they have to do footnotes for or add in. Mm -hmm. Um, So it all depends. Yeah. It's so hard to say, here's a 30,000-word book. How much is it going to cost? Because it's just not that cut and dry, unfortunately. Right. It's not. And I, I suggest, I've always told people, do as much of the work in advance that you possibly can before handing it off to an editor. Yeah. Now that does not mean that by the time you're done, it's not going to need to be edited exactly. and that it's, you know, all good. And I already and did perfect. all the work. Yeah, no, yeah. but I, I do, I go through and through and through and make sure. And I think Caroline has seen my stacks of drafts, you know, after I've done the pen to paper editing, I will print out a fresh copy and do another round of pen to paper editing until I feel like we've kind of filtered this thing out. See, you're like an editor's dream. <laughs> and and I have worked with authors who literally have never read a book before mm-hmm. and they don't know what their genre is and so they don't know what to really write or how to write it because they don't even know what dialogue looks like mm. in a book. Yeah. And so those are probably the ones that are the most challenging right. for me 
because there really hasn't been a lot of work on the part of the author mm -hmm. up front in order to help me help them. Right, right. Um, what is it, Jerry Maguire? Is that, yes, is that movie? Yes. Help me help you. <laughs> um, and, and that really takes, a. it's going to be a lot less expensive mm -hmm. if you go through and, and do what you need to do before you submit your manuscript for editing right. um, than if you make your editor do all of that work because yeah, it's if way you more time consuming. If you doing right now, I'm, I'm doing the developmental right. changing chapters around and moving, I mean, just complete, you know, yeah. And, and that really is the author's job. Mm -hmm. You know, the author's job is to make sure that everything is as complete as it possibly can yes. be before it's submitted. Right. And we have, you know, standards on our website, um, publishing requests mm -hmm. or that we ask for the, man, for the authors to have done. But I can't tell you how many manuscripts I've had submitted that are all different colors. They're different font sizes. <laughs> they've messed with the layout. And then I have to go back in. Don't do any of those things, those of you who are writing a book. <laughs> Times New Roman, 12-point font, double space. That's it. Don't, don't even do tab stops. Just make it. Keep it simple, Make it, and yeah. and we'll come back through because we have to clean all that up and get rid of everything, right? And start from scratch, and that is going to cost you more money, right. To have to go through and clean up the layout, so that gives new meaning to write the vision, make it plain, exactly. <laughs> make it plain, uh, make it plain, simple. Keep it simple. <laughs> we'll be right back. Uncle Dan, mom. Dad? If you store your guns properly, so not just anyone can get to them. I'll feel safer when I'm playing outside. Safer when walking home. Safer when my friends come over. As your neighbor, I'll feel safer. As a school teacher, I'll feel safer. We'll all feel safer. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. Great leaders aren't born. They're made, and not just anywhere. They're made in special places by special qualified trainers in places like the Academy of Creative Coaching. The Academy of Creative Coaching is an international certification program with courses in health and wellness coaching, spiritual coaching, relationship coaching, executive coaching, life coaching, and cultural competency coaching. Courses are online, hybrid, or face-to-face. -face. The Academy of Creative Coaching is empowering coaches to empower the world. Make a positive change in yourself and the world. Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com. Listen, as a hiring manager, I've got to tell you, the best job candidate isn't always the typical candidate. Sometimes they're a grad of life. Meet the grads of life. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. Sometimes the best candidates aren't the ones you're used to. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Over. <laughs> we have been just, just talking, talking and talking. <laughs> so, um, so I think okay. Well, Caroline's coming back, and we're doing this again yes. <laughs> because there's so much, so much to cover. It's just such a big topic, yeah. you know, writing and publishing. So we're gonna do this again very soon. Um, but is there any? I guess closing words and parting words, words of wisdom that you can give somebody who's thinking about writing, who's saying, I want my book out in 2018. What do you recommend for them? Well, I think the balance challenge that we issued is a good one, yeah. um, you know, to, to help them continue to write and, and do that every day. And, you know, I even suggest that you could uh, invest in Dragon Speak software if oh, you're yeah. not comfortable writing mm -hmm. um, every day or, you know, use your your notes on your phone or your voice recorder to take notes when you have ideas about your book. Back it Most, up on the cloud. Back it up on the cloud. <laughs> Most um, people tell me that they have their best ideas when they're driving, when they're in the shower, or when they're exercising. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So 
Um, and that's usually when your mind is clear, or you're thinking about all kinds of other things. So uh, your voice recorder on your phone is going to be a way to really quickly and easily take notes for mm-hmm. yourself. And then you can go back and listen to them later when you're writing for 15 minutes. That can be what you do is just take your voice recordings and jot them down in your no- journal, writing journal, right, basically. Right. Um, in addition to that, do your research. Know what your specific publishing company is looking for because they're all different. There's a mm-hmm. giant agents and literary handbook at every library and every Barnes and Noble. And each one of those tells you what um, genre they publish in, Mm -hmm. when they accept manuscripts, usually their address, their phone number, all that information. Also in the Chicago Manual of Style, there is a section in the very beginning on author responsibilities before submitting their manuscripts to publishers. Some of it's a little bit technical, um, but you could certainly go to a library. Chicago Manual of Style is online. Um, It's CMOS, C-M-O-S dot com. And it's in the 16th edition now. And um, you can just look at that. And mm-hmm. you can do a 90-day free trial, read those 20 pages, see what you need to do. Because like I said, every publisher conforms to Chicago. Yeah. So you're not going to be wrong if you go with the Chicago way of, of manuscript, you know, looking at it in the beginning. Um, but know what your publisher is looking for. Know your target audience. That's a whole other topic that we can cover yeah. on the next yeah, show. That was super to. important. Um, <laughs> know your target advice. audience. Think about your marketing potential and really kind of understand where you're going in terms of this being a business okay. too. Yes. There's a lot of parting words. I know. Sorry. It's a no, and it's like, gosh, I, I hate that it's over. So we're, we're definitely going to have Caroline back um, very soon. I already have a date in mind, so we'll see if she can come on that date. Next week, we are going to have comedian Kathy Doobie right here in the studio. I look forward to it. So stay with us. Have a Merry Christmas. Um, all of that. And I will see you all next week, next Thursday from 11 to 1. I'm Dr. Pamela. And remember, it's your life. Love it.